Hello and welcome everybody. Let me get started here. Okay, and I'm going to bring us. So thank you very much everyone for joining us today. I'm so excited for the event. I hope you enjoyed the networking session that we just had. Uh, we are going to get started by introducing the president and CEO of WeTech Alliance, Yvonne, to get us started. Yvonne, welcome. I think we're just bringing her up on stage now. There we go. Hi. Hey, thanks, Aislinn. Um, welcome, everyone, to the inaugural Tech Homecoming Chatham Kent edition. This event is powered by WeTech Alliance and the Chatham Kent Economic Development Corporation. We hope you enjoyed this new platform. Uh, we know everyone's a bit zoomed out these days or teamed out, I guess I could say. Um, so we went with a, a new platform called Remo, thanks to our friends at the Canadian Tech Network. So thank you to them for allowing us to leverage their license to bring you this unique experience. So over the next 60 minutes, uh, we'll be bringing together Chatham area expats former residents um, and leaders to reconnect with the place they once called home and really join in on a conversation of changing and bringing Chatham Kent into a hub of innovation. All of today's speakers will receive, and I, Aislinn, if you can just go back to the other slide, perfect. All today's attendees, speakers, and panelists will receive this really useful art piece. You can print it at home, you can download it at home, and you can even print it locally if you wish. So you're probably wondering, for those that don't know me, who am I? So as Aislinn mentioned, my name is Yvonne Pilon. I'm the president and CEO of WeTech Alliance, one of 17 regional innovation centers in the province of Ontario, serving the Windsor, Essex, and Chatham Kent area. We are here to support tech enabled and tech entrepreneurs and founders to help them create, innovate, and accelerate. And we've been doing that since 2011. I'm beyond excited today to be starting kicking things off again for our inaugural homecoming edition, but I do want to go through a few logistics because I know this platform is new to some of you. So first off, if you want to join the discussion, you will see on the right hand side a chat feature, which I know everyone is already chatting. You can join in on the discussion. You can private message any of the other attendees by just clicking on their icon. If you'd like to use full screen mode, you'll see in any of these slides a little expand button. So if you want to focus on myself or a video or one of the slides today, feel free to do that as well. Uh, you can update your digital business card. So if you look at your top icon there where your, your image is, you can actually add your social media platforms and LinkedIn profiles and share those amongst other uh, attendees. If you have a question for our panelists, and let me tell you, our panelists are amazing. You can use the Q&A feature again to the right, uh, put your questions in there. And in fact, you can also upvote those questions if you see a question that you. And finally, this presentation will be recorded. So if you missed it or can't stay for the whole thing, we will be uh, sure to send it out in the follow up email and it will be available on WeTech Alliance's YouTube channel. So this year, we texted ready to do whatever we could to support founders, talent, and community. We have spent time educating ourselves minute by minute, day by day on new support measures and giving back to the community through things like 3D printed face shields, leveraging our team, our network across Ontario, Canada, and even North America, connecting with our clients, building and delivering new support programs uh, for Main Street businesses and women entrepreneurs, such as the F5 program, and digital Main Street, including supporting over 20 Chatham Kent companies with their digital transformation. And just today announcing $20,000 to support two tourism based businesses in Chatham Kent with their digital adoption strategy. We've also connected with healthcare innovators through our MedHealth cross border cluster. We've helped scale back up companies through our tech accelerator happening every winter and, and fall. And we've connected and listened to our regional tech CEOs to understand what their pain points are, what their needs are to ensure we best support our tech companies. And more importantly, we've also, I should say more importantly, but we also celebrated our 10 year anniversary to look back on what's been accomplished in the last 10 years. So over the last 30, 365 days, Aislinn, if you can just go back to the slide uh, with the media releases. We have seen entrepreneurs pivot, grow, diversify. These are just a few of the many media screenshots um, in the past year demonstrating the resilience of Chatham Kent people and companies. And I would be remiss if I didn't acknowledge the 20 students and teachers from the Chatham Christian School who started their rookie 
first robotics teams, Flames Robotics, even amid a global pandemic. Despite a full year of curveballs and pivots, one thing has remained top priority, and that was to do our best to keep things virtual, businesses virtual for our over 300 clients. This includes connecting them to funding, to tech perks, experts, entrepreneurs and residents, customers, talents, even building new 30, 60, 90 day milestone trackers for there, and so much more. The next year, we will continue to build upon our 10 year foundation of supporting entrepreneurs and championing innovation. I'd like to share with you our 2021 and 2022 areas of focus. And I won't, I promise I won't read off the slide, but they are regional reach. Why is this important? There are so much opportunities for entrepreneurial growth and innovation still yet to be discovered in all elements of Windsor, Essex and Chatham Kent. And if you're watching today and you are a tech entrepreneur or a tech enabled company, please feel free to reach out to us to see how we can support you along your growth journey. Colliding the innovation ecosystem. Why is this important? We know when innovations collide, innovation explodes. Access to capital. We know one of the biggest pain points for entrepreneurs is accessing capital. Activating the experts and entrepreneurs. We know that in order to build a thriving startup community, we need entrepreneurs in the driver's seat. And that's what we hope to do. In fact, we're engaging some of our amazing entrepreneurs and tech leaders today in this tech homecoming presentation. Intellectual property, we know that it is about educating our clients about protecting their ideas and sector focuses. We know the economy is changing and it's all about maximizing what's to come in the future. As we look to the future and we look at what does five years from now look like for us, Aislinn, next slide. These are our big goals. They are to grow technology and tech enabled companies, to connect the tech talent with innovation ecosystem, to build a clubhouse, a sense of place for the tech community, and to find our next founders to create new companies. For those of you who are interested and you want to learn more about the predictions for the next year and then so on, we have a great event, next slide, coming up on May 11th. It's the Technology Media Telecommunications Predictions with guest speaker, Duncan Stewart. I can attest if you've seen Duncan speak, he is amazing. This is a free event in partnership with our friends at Chatham Kent Economic Development, Soar Innovation, City of Windsor, and the now Windsor Essex Economic Development Corporation, which is now we uh, invest Windsor Essex. We could not do this event without amazing partners. And one of those amazing partners for the number of years has been the Chatham Kent Economic Development Corporation. So it is my pleasure to introduce Jamie Rainberg. He's the manager of economic development at the municipality of Chatham Kent to give half of Chatham Kent. Aislinn, perhaps what we will do instead of uh, Jamie doing, we'll go to Mayor Canis, um video and then we'll cool. work with Jamie on the back end, okay? Perfect. All right. So we'll be right back, folks. Let me get that started. Morning, everyone. I'm Darren Caniff, Mayor of Chatham-Kent. I want to welcome everybody to the first annual Tech Homecoming. This is an exciting event uh, as tech is our future. As we move forward, it becomes more and more of our daily lives. And I want looking at the panel, we've got five amazing ex-Chatham-Kent people that still consider Chatham-Kent home. I'm excited about that. They've went on to big careers throughout North America. So I'm looking forward to hearing what they have to say. I look forward to seeing what we need to be doing in Chatham-Kent to advance tech here. I'd like to see more tech jobs. I want to see us take more advantage of technology. This is a great opportunity for us all. So thanks to EcDev Small Business Center and WeTech for bringing this part of it and looking forward to learning a lot of great things. Thanks. But thank you again, Amir Caniff. And again, I can't say enough uh, great things about the team at Economic Development and Small Business Center helping put us together. Um, if we can't get Jamie in, we might have to just, well, we can we, we can improvise. What we'll do, um, again, Jamie, we'll still, we'll still work with you, but perhaps Aislinn, we can now bring up. So one of the things we wanted to do today was to not only acknowledge our leaders in the Chatham-Kent region, but also our technology company leaders. So I'd love to Perhaps if we can skip forward, we'll go to Patricia Riopel, the president of Scribendi. Uh, interesting enough, Patricia is a somewhat newcomer. In 2007, Patricia um, purchased Scribendi, an amazing technology company based in Chatham-Kent. And we've asked Patricia to just bring some greetings today to 
what's happening with Scribendi and some of her thoughts on how Chatham Kent can become a hub of innovation. So Patricia, I will welcome you to the screen. Hi. Hi there. Did I get my mic to work? I think sound fantastic. I think you, you can hear me, right? Yep. Awesome. Okay. So thank you. Thank you for, for having me. Um, yes. I, so I'm, I'm Patricia. I'm the president of Scribendi. I actually so uh, um, came to the region, not 2007, 2017. So about four and a half uh, uh, years ago um, to take over this business from, from, from the founder, who's uh, Chandra Clark, who's from the region, who's from uh, Thamesville, actually. Um, Scribendi, just to give you the quick rundown, is a, a language tech business. Um, you can essentially view us as uh, the Uber for uh, editing and proofreading services. So we essentially um, correct uh, grammar errors uh, and, and uh, language uh, errors uh, for authors who uh, want to get published either in academic journals or uh, who publish works of fiction, businesses, anything that is written in English. Um, you know, I, I was asked to prepare uh, for, for certain questions here, um, one of which is like, what, what is the impact of Scribendi uh, uh, locally? So, you know, uh, Scribendi uh, is more than $2 million in local wages that we pay yearly. Um, it's, it's providing tech jobs, AI jobs, uh, editorial jobs, which are uh, opportunities differentiated in, across the region. Um, you know, we, we do not only that, but right now, you know, in the news in Ontario, you hear a lot about paid sick leave and how this is a, a, a brand new thing. You know, at Scribendi, we've been paying for, you know, five days of paid sick leave. That's kind of a given for us. Uh, you know, we give a, a lot of uh, leave for as well for if you want to get vaccinated in this COVID era. So in terms of impact for the local population, I think it's very important that we have local businesses um, <clears throat> that are homegrown like us to just uh, provide the vitality uh, that this uh, region uh, uh, needs. Um, another question they've asked me is, you know, how, how can CK become a hub of innovation? And I think, um, you know, at the end of the day, it, it, the quick answer is by having people like, like our speakers that are invited uh, here today uh, to come home and start businesses. Uh, you know, they say, they say home is where the heart is. And one of the big enablers here is, is that we need more entrepreneurs with heart. Um, people who uh, come here to start companies, not only because, uh, uh, you know, the economic conditions are right, the opportunities are right, it's a low cost uh, re region, it's a, it's a great place to start a company, but, but more than that, because this is where their home is, this is where their heart is, because this is where they care um, to create opportunities for everybody around them. Um, and, and I think that's one of the key to success. So I, you know, I, I, I thank you very much for uh, our speakers who have a, a agreed to kind of share a bit of their experience that are from here. And I encourage them, come back, come home, um, come start companies, come act as uh, role models uh, for the uh, next generation of, of tech leaders uh, that are that are kind of coming up through through the ranks ar ar around here, and uh, I think this is going to be a key enabler um, for the future for the region. So thank you very much, Yvonne. Thank you to uh, the city as well for for having me, uh, and I, I really look forward to hearing all about our speakers. Thank you so much, Patricia, and a big thank you to Scribendi for all they do. $2 million in wages, just amazing. And uh, a big shout out to Bill Johnson, who also sits on our board of directors from Scribendi. So thank you very much. So now we're going to move to Michael Stanford. He's uh, prepared a wonderful message for us. He's a vice president of marketing at Tech Savvy. Uh, again, Tech Savvy has been a big advocate for the technology community. In fact, they supported this year's Tech Awards. And ironically, Patricia uh, won our Women in Tech Award for 2021. So now we're going to share some greetings from Michael. Good morning. It's terrific to be with you today at WeTech Alliance's homecoming. My name is Mike Stanford, and I am the Vice President of Marketing at Tech Savvy Solutions. We are very pleased to be able to support this event today, and we look forward to working with WeTech on future events and initiatives just like this one. Our involvement with WeTech is relatively new, but I believe it is an important relationship to grow as it connects us with you. 
a community of tech entrepreneurs, innovators, mentors, and founders. It connects us with this ecosystem, an ecosystem that is vitally important for the economic development of this region. There have been many lessons learned in the past year living with the pandemic, but one takeaway is that we don't have to be tethered to large urban centers. We have the tools, platforms, and technologies for innovation to happen anywhere. But in saying this, we also acknowledge the continued imperative of having these strong supporting ecosystems. Inventors, innovators, mentors, and investors need to be present to ensure a growing tech hub exists and is contributing to the continuous economic development of this region. Tech Savvy has a keen interest in seeing Chatham Kent and all of Southwestern Ontario grow and prosper. We're headquartered here. The vast majority of our staff and employees live in this region. Many, many, many of our business and residential customers call this region home. Economic prosperity and growth in this region means that Tech Savvy grows and continues to contribute in meaningful ways to this region. And that is very important to us as a company. Tech Savvy has always been and remains hometown proud. And we are eager to continue our work and help Chatham Kent become an innovation hub. We wanna play our part in this region's development. This event is one part of this for us, but we're also working hard in other areas to build the infrastructure required for this region to grow and develop. Going forward, Tech Savvy is planning on investing approximately $250 million over the coming five years in broadband infrastructure in Southwestern Ontario. We're working with local, provincial and federal government agencies to put fiber in the ground so that your homes and businesses have greater access to the networks and platforms that drive the global economy. We're also building out our LTE wireless footprint to help connect the digital divide that exists in this country between the rural and urban centers. All told over the next five years, we expect to connect an additional 60,000 homes and businesses to modern high-speed broadband networks. On the commercial side, we're strengthening our product offerings for small and medium businesses, moving beyond simple voice and data connectivity with innovative products like Multilink for network redundancy or our new managed services that help remote workers connect easily and securely to their networks from any location. At Tech Savvy, we know starting a new company or business can be challenging and that large groups play a major role in supporting you at this critical stage of development. And that is why, just as importantly, we want to play an active role in this region's community of innovators, working with you, providing you with communications and network solutions you need to be successful, staying up to date with the latest and greatest developments, and keeping our eye out for innovative new ideas. We welcome opportunities where perhaps we can work with you on paths to commercialization of your products. So thank you again, We Tech Alliance, for inviting us. I hope you all have a great homecoming today. Thank you. Now, Aislinn, what we'll do is we'll get started with the main event. And it is my pleasure to introduce Matt Rayom. He will be your moderator and the king of dad jokes today for again, this inaugural tech homecoming. And Matt Rayom is the economic development officer at the municipality of Chatham-Kent. Uh, Matt, thank you so much for joining us. You get the most amazing opportunity to interview, um, again, four amazing individuals. Uh, just before I turn myself off, uh, off screen here, uh, I can say a lot of these individuals, in fact, I've, I just met Alan today um, and I've got to know Justine through uh, a number of initiatives. She sat on our board of directors. I met Mike Pegg uh, through Twitter and uh, John Duvall is a friend of the regional innovation ecosystem. And I can tell you, you were all in for such an amazing event. So now I'm gonna turn my mic off and my camera and pass it over to Matt Ram to lead us off with our panel discussion and introducing our panelists. 
Thank, thank you, Yvonne. Uh, yeah, my name is Matt Rayon, Economic Development Officer at Municipality of Chatham-Kent, and I am excited and humbled to be moderating today's session along with our amazing event producer, the great Aislinn Laurent. Well, as uh, Patricia said earlier, it's an incredible time to be coming back to Chatham-Kent or just coming here in general. Some of the uh, some are coming back because of the past. They grew up here. Their friends and family are here. But for others, it's because of the future. Uh, these days, the future of agri-food is being grown and tested here. Uh, we grow for the world. It's not just a tagline. Chatham Kent leads the world in production of over 70 crop varieties from fruits to vegetables, plants and grains. Chatham Kent is growing and moving, and we are thrilled to give a big welcome back to some new and old friends of Chatham Kent. To help guide today's Tech Homecoming panel discussion, we'll be, we'll be following the four key innovation themes. Innovation and entrepreneurship, infrastructure and technology, future economy, and a big one, uh, talking about talent. I'd now like to introduce our panel of distinguished guests. They are former residents, expats, regular visitors, and they are tech and innovation leaders. I'd like to start by welcoming Justine Jansen, Justine Jansen uh, grew up in Chatham's North End, where she attended Tecumseh Public School, John N. Given, and Chatham Kent Secondary School. She was active in the community through volunteering, work, sports, and remains tied to Chatham as a board member and investor. Uh, today, Justine lives in London, Ontario, with her partner Eric and three kids. And professionally, she is the Senior Vice President of Strategic Initiatives at Ceridian, where she leads new ventures and growth initiatives, including scaling Ceridian's flagship software, Dayforce, from a tech startup into a leading global HR technology platform. Justine has been recognized as one of Canada's top 40 under 40, one of Canada's top 100 most powerful women, and as one of the top 25 Canadian women in tech. Welcome. Need pyrotechnics and confetti after that, after those accolades. Uh, but welcome, you. Justine. Thank <laughs> you. So happy yeah. to be here. Yeah. Next, we're going to introduce Don Deval, CEO uh, at Norcat. Uh, Don has spent more than two decades leading, growing, transforming organizations and businesses, working with multinational companies, tech startups, academic research institution, governments, and clients around the world. As CEO of NORCAT, he has transformed the organization to become a global, multifaceted enterprise focused on providing programs, services, and resources to prepare current and fu future workers uh, with the right skills and uh, confidence to succeed. Don is also the founder and co-manager, uh, partnering uh, a Sudbury Catalyst Fund, a unique $5 million co-investment C capital venture uh, based in Sudbury, Ontario. Previously, Don served as VP of Strategy Operations for the Mars Discovery District, an investment director for Mars Investment Accelerator Fund, and as senior manager with, within Deloitte Consulting. He's an active angel investor and holds a variety of board positions. And academically, he holds an undergraduate degree in chemistry from Queens and a master of applied science and engineering from the U University of Toronto. Welcome, Don. Some great accolades as well. We're, we're in great company. This is uh, so far an astounding panel. And we got two more to go and uh, it, it's amazing. So welcome, Don. Uh, I believe you're supposed to do an interpretive dance while we're uh, we're doing this. So feel free in the background to, to work your magic. I will do it while my camera is off. They're perfect, <laughs> perfect. Uh, next, I'd like to welcome Mike Pegg, head of Google Maps Platform Developer Relations at Google. Uh, Mike started at Google 14 years ago in Waterloo and then transferred to its headquarters in Mountain View, California a few years later. He and his team helped developers and businesses from around the world build apps that use Google Maps platforms. He was raised in Chatham, Kent, calls Blenheim his hometown, and grew up on a farm in Rondo. Uh, he graduated from Georgian College in Aurelia as a development, developmental services worker. Welcome, Mike. Thank you so much for joining this panel. Um, I got to tell you, Google Maps is like my lifesaver for everything in life. Um, it's become a platform that I use to search for businesses and find my way around anywhere <laughs> so awesome to hear great yeah, and so, thanks for having me you're welcome mike next i'd like to introduce alan livingston product management director at google um alice alan is a wallsburg native and a graduate of wallsburg district secondary mm -hmm. school he attended the university of waterloo and received a degree in electrical engineering after graduating he made his way to toronto and worked as a software engineer at a number of startups a few years later alan moved to oxford england for a master's and for the past 13 years he's been working for google first in the uk 
and then in California on a number of different products. Welcome, Alan. Thank so, you. It is great to be here. Yeah, well, thank you. And welcome back to Chatham Kent. I know uh, hearing your discussions previously, um, you've all got stories about uh, back in the day and uh, you know, uh, some commonalities and even uh, Mike and Alan, you, you met in the hallways of Google or, or at a party, I apologize. And uh, you found your connection to, back to Chatham Kent uh, that way. Um, I wonder if you could just take a few moments uh, to uh, all of you to talk briefly about your background and connection to Chatham Kent and uh, tell us about Chatham Kent as you knew it. We, we can go start with Alan. We'll start with you. <laughs> okay, great. Uh, th thanks, Mike. And it's the uh, the curse of starting with an A. Uh, you got to go first all the time. Uh, phys ed class, the same kind of thing. The other kids can watch and do better. So um, connection to Chatham Kent, you know, I mean, grew up here, uh, obviously. And, um, you know, I, I grew up, I uh, was born in Chatham originally, and then grew up and uh, spent my uh, days in Wallsburg uh, growing up. And uh, my family's still in the area. So I come back pretty frequently, even through this uh, pandemic, I actually made it back last summer. Um, you know, when I think about sort of the community as it's changed, it's, um, it's really amazing. And I think about the opportunities that are available to people now um, in Chatham-Kent versus, you know, many years ago when, uh, when I grew up, it's so different. And it's, I think the, inf the access to information and the access um, to just the globe, um, and so I, I was reflecting on it and I thought about it, you know, when I was a kid, um, the big excitement for me, and this is going to be pretty nerdy, but the big excitement was I convinced my father to take me to the big library in Chatham and you could, you know, get some different books and you could learn a little bit about technology or things like that. And, you know, now you think about, you know, the internet with, with, with YouTube, with, with all these different places, I see my children being able to access so much more information and it has nothing to do with where we live, right? And I think that is going to be a fundamentally transformative thing for, for, for Chad and Ken. And you know, with, with everyone working remote now, seeing how this can all work, um, I'm just really excited about it. And, and I think it's, it's so different, that mindset. Like when I was growing up, you know, you were gonna move to the big city or something, right? And that was gonna be the thing that you were gonna do you, because you, you needed access to other people and things. And now you don't have to do that. And so, um, you know, I, like I said, I, I think it's just amazing to think about this opportunity and this transformation that's available to Chatham Kent. That's amazing. Thank you, Alan. Uh, Don, we'll go with you next. Your connection to Chatham Kent and, uh, you know, um, how was Chatham Kent as you knew it? Yeah, so connection to Chatham Kent. Uh, obviously grew up there, elementary school at Victor Lorston, high school at CCI. Um, my formative high school years, I actually moved with my family to Cedar Springs, uh, ultra, uh, I guess, rural in the context of uh, small city centers. Um, avid in sports, uh, basketball, volleyball, track, wasn't very good in any of the three, but still played them and, uh, you know, huge part of, uh, of my life. Um, yeah, and just had a wonderful experience, you know, from a career, my contribution to the community's GDP. I'll give you the bookends of my working career there. Started out as a delivery boy with the Chatham Daily News. I would say 25% of the deliveries are probably done by my parents when it was raining. Um, and then I ended my career working at the Buckhorn Cafe in Cedar Springs. So anyone on the way to Rio? Um, you know, in terms of just general, you know, commentary on the community as I remember it, you know, one thing I'll, I'll share that I, I think holds true for most people from maybe smaller communities, but especially in Chatham, the relationships and friendships in that community, uh, you know, I'm proud to say that many of those individuals that I met, be it in elementary or high school, are still some of my closest friends today, and we still, you know, manage to do so even though we all live in different communities. So I don't know what the, you know, je ne sais quoi is or what, you know, what was in the water in that community. But, you know, I remember a community that was just rooted in friendships, relationships, you know, families doing things. Um, and, you know, it's, it's wonderful going home. Um, my parents, uh, you know, still live in Chatham. I'm there very frequently. I get a chance to try to connect with friends. So just a wonderful experience growing up. So much, Don. That's, that's amazing. And, uh, I think the water is pretty good out there, so nothing to worry about what's in the water. So, <laughs> uh, Justine, we'll go with you next. Your connection to Chatham Kent, and and how did you remember Chatham Kent growing up? Yeah, um, so 
I did, wasn't born in Chatham. I was born in Hamilton, actually, but from the age of two on, lived in Chatham until after I graduated university. Um, graduated from the French program at CK. Um, sounds like Don, you and I had a similar path. I started delivering the Sears catalogs, then hosted birthday parties at the YMCA in between corn detasseling stints. So fairly, I think, uh, Chatham uh, growing up background beans for a couple of years when I was too short. Um, and then moved on from there to Western. I actually, my first job was in Dallas, Texas. And the buddy that they signed me up with was this guy named Daryl Rose, who was from CCI. So just like some of the other collisions we talked about, I ended up with a Chatham person down in Dallas, um, moved around a bunch, but I've always stayed pretty connected to the community. My uh, family still has business there. Was fortunate to see um, through my dad, a, a number of businesses get started in um, in Chatham. And then we continue, my partner and I, to invest and support, whether that's through um, boards or other initiatives as, as best we can. Because I, I do think what Patricia said at the beginning that, you know, home is where the heart is, is a really big thing. But also what you said, Dawn, about like, there is something about the community that like comes together around people and around ideas in a really beautiful way. Like I think about that, the May miracle thing that happened and just like, what a like heart felt like honestly for me like really emotional and like like pride swelling thing to see the community come together but even as I've grown up like the the Capitol Theater wrote me a letter when I graduated university like I don't know who, who does that like su such nice um things I, I feel like the community really cares about um it's it's people and and uh this past week we or we did a grade eight reunion. I thought three people were going to show up because I graduated grade eight like 20 years ago and our whole class came for, for virtually, obviously. Um, but that I just don't think you would see that in, in other centers. So I think that's a pretty cool part. And that's what I think about. That's awesome. Thank you, Justine. And uh, I do believe corn and tasseling is a, a rite of passage as you're growing up. If you haven't done it, then you haven't lived in Chatham, Kent, right? So that's uh, <laughs> a badge of honor for many. Um, Mike, we'll go to you, uh, your connection to Chatham Kent and, uh, how do you remember it? Yeah. Um, since everyone's, uh, naming their elementary schools and high schools, I'll start, I'll start there. I, I started in, at Harvard Raleigh, but then I went on to WJ Baird and then I'm a proud Blenheim Bobcat. So I think we played uh, football against a lot of the big Chatham schools and, and definitely the, I think in Wellsburg was it the Wellsburg Tartans. It, yeah. So. Uh, yeah, so that, that's the background educationally. Um, I think uh, I, I ended up leaving the area and going off to college out of the area and didn't didn't return. Um, but I think the thing that struck, strikes me the most really about the area was technology, actually. I think about um, my mom being really uh, connected to what technology were in the schools. At that time, computer labs were kind of being created school. So there were Commodore 64 computer labs and making sure that we had whatever computer was in that computer lab at home. And there weren't many kids that had those computers yet. So one of the first was a Commodore or a pet before that. And then I think I was one of a handful of kids at Blenheim High School that had a PC. And so I remember connecting the most with people that also had a PC. Uh, there's a person by the name of Greg Sparling, who some of you, you may know, uh, sold me my first modem on the school bus. Uh, sold me a 1200 baud uh, modem and that connected me to BB, the BBS world and kind of out online and connecting with the rest of the world. So I feel like I kind of, uh, I think most about that and and I've kept in touch with a lot of those people as well. Don, the same with you. Well, I meet mean, here in, in the Bay Area um, are, are not saying that they're friends with a huge collection of people from their high school days. Uh, it does seem like a really unique uh, thing for, for chatting Ken, so. Some thanks, Mike. And uh, yeah, Greg Sparling, he's done some great innovation work with uh, RM Sotheby's as well in the early days, creating infrastructure and whatnot. So awesome connection. Uh, it's neat to kind of look back and, and, and talk about the history. Uh, if we go back just, um, you know, not as far, we look at, think back to 2020 and early 2021. Um, it, it was a tough year. That's, that's a tough year and a half. That's a big understatement with what's been going on. Um, you know, when we're going through tough times, it's, it's, it's good to look at uh, the good and we want to see what's happening. It's good. Um, so I wonder, this is for any one of you, um, what would be a silver lining that has come out of COVID-19, the pandemic, uh, something that kind of jumps out at you. 
And if you're for the uh, participants, you can write in the chat as well if you've got uh, some things that you noticed as well. But uh, for any one of you, uh, what are some silver linings that have come out of the, the pandemic? Um, sure, I'll, I'll go. I mean, it's, uh, yeah. you know, obviously, the, you know, the pandemic, first of all, has been s such a, a, a tough situation for everyone. Um, everywhere. And, um, you, you know, as, as we see ourselves kind of coming out, you see the light at the end of the tunnel on it. You know, I think it's also important to remember that other places maybe, you know, are still um, are still going through tougher times and are maybe still on different places on the curve. But, you know, that, that said, I think the silver lining, if you look at it, is the opportunity to um, be flexible about where you work. And um, last... Uh, Last summer, I actually spent a um, couple months working uh, from Chamcat, something that I wouldn't have been ever, you know, I wouldn't have been able to do previously. And, um, you know, I was working from a farm and it was a really, it was a, like, such a nice experience to be able to do that, to be connected um, and be, you know, as productive as you're going to be and, um, and, and access to, you know, the things everyone talks about, the community. Um, the great outdoors, all of these things, a lifestyle that's that's available in Chatham Kent. So I think there are glimmers of that um, and that ability and and that change. And so I think um, it's it's up to us to um, you know to to build on these ideas. And and I was actually really excited when I saw the tech savvy intro, things like that, because just you know that was actually my main problem. I remember was how am I going to get reliable high speed internet? It's going to be there when I need it to work. Like can I guarantee it's going to be there? But knowing it's going to be there, especially in the rural setting then um you know it opens up a whole different set of possibilities so i think that's that's been um probably the the big thing and as yvonne said it's it really is a game changer about how people think um where what it means to 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 be you know where you're gonna live what's what's the place that you live in mean where you used to have to you know you used to have to go where the factory was right or then you know more recently you'd have to go where the the people were that, that were in that industry. And now it's different, right? You have that opportunity. Maybe you want to stay home or you want to go where the community is. So I think that's a really interesting movement. And, you know, when you're working from home, you're also sharing that connection with your kids who are doing school online and your other partner that's working from home possibly. So it's important to have that good infrastructure and uh, great Wi-Fi connection. Mm -hmm. <laughs> uh, anyone else that's got uh, a silver lining coming out of the pandemic? I think um, building on what you said, Alan, I think just optimizing for life, like we got to, I mean, I was typically traveling four days a week and being home, like home, home with my kids um, every day and eating dinner at home every day and just starting to rethink, you know, what, uh, what really is efficient when it comes to um, meetings and trying to, to build impact. Um, I think that opportunity to optimize for life and, and this window to kind of rethink how we work is a real important silver lining and, and not just for work for lots of things like healthcare and um and travel and, and all sorts of um, facets of our life yeah just just to echo that you know from uh you know i'll share two one on, on a personal side i think the the pandemic has given people a, a moment to pause and reflect and have an enhanced level of appreciation on the importance of relationships you know, I think if you reflect back this notion of, hey, I'll get around to seeing so-and-so or, you know, I'll try to get to visit my folks, uh, you know, over the holidays. I think when you when you remove the ease and capability of physically seeing people that are important to you, you realize just how important it is to have that interaction as a core driver of your happiness and, and social well-being. And I can tell you from a personal note, I have never, uh, you know, wanted to spend as much time with my friends and family as I have now because it's been removed and it's challenging to do so. And I will, I'll take that as a silver lining kind of in perpetuity as things even start to open up where, you know, no more reasons to defer or to pause. So I think, I think a lot of people, myself on a personal note, uh, have an enhanced appreciation for, for those friendships. And then kind of the macroeconomic one, uh, I am so excited, optimistic, um, you know, from a medical perspective, we went from a serious viral infection on a global stage to a vaccine in less than 12 months. I think we've rethought our entire model of medical development, clinical trials, uh, you know, pathways to bring new drugs to market. I think we've blown up the entire model. And I can tell you going forward, I just have so much 
optimism and, and excitement in, uh, in that profession to address, you know, intractable societal issues. I, I think it's a game changer. And so I think that ability to be resilient and to get business done is inspiring. Absolutely. And I think a lot of what Alan was saying too about this, the ability to be able to uh, connect and communicate with people has enabled that, like the speed at which those vaccines were developed and, 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 you know, trialed and tested and, and distributed. I, I'm also in complete awe of that, of that timeline. Um, I think I would, I would agree with everything everyone said. I think also with our teams as well, I think some of the um, just, I think when when the the team that I'm a part of returns back to office, we haven't done that yet um, since uh, what March of last year. Um, I think we'll also have some empathy and understanding about the people that we're with. I think Don, the, that connection with relationships, like just the things that people have gone through, and what you've been able to learn about what people have gone through this year may not have been possible before. It wasn't possible before. You just there wasn't opportunities to get to that level with people. So. I think the human connection within work is also something that's been interesting for me. Uh, I've gotten to know people on my team I think we lost Mike. He's left the table. Something upset him. <laughs> the importance of a uh, reliable broadband. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Uh, uh, I'm not sure. There he is. Um, so yeah, I think just just that um, that's the solution. really getting to know people at a much deeper level within the work context. Also with family, I have lunch with my family every day, uh, which is unheard of, you know, before before this. So forces to kind of uh, look at things a bit differently and uh, approach things differently. So um, yeah, some great themes there. Um, I'd like to move on to the discussion into the innovation side of things. Um, innovation is central to some of the challenges facing rural regions. Um, and when you think about uh, some of the tech companies that are in rural areas, um, the feeling is that they're they're kind of hidden below. They're not they're not highlighted. Um, when I think about in Chatham, Kent, we've got some amazing tech companies, but uh, you have to dig deep to kind of find find them and find who they are. Um, so given that, how can we empower and create a more entrepreneurial and innovation friendly community? Uh, that highlights those those themes. And we can go with uh, who, who wants to grab that one. Um, I, I'm Tom? happy to start. Um, Perfect, yeah. it, it kind of ambivalent, I guess. But you know, just just to share some context, I think that might be of value to the viewers. You know, I think that there needs to be recognition that how you and support, encourage, inspire, you know, entrepreneurships and a startup tech community, you need to recognize that it's different in rural communities versus urban communities. And I can say that with credibility given, you know, I spent most of my career downtown Toronto, right in Kensington Market. It doesn't get much more urban than that. And then I spent years living in the States. And I think when you recognize that, you get kind of this creative push to figure out, well, let's, let's celebrate and exploit what rural communities have that they don't have in large urban centers and use that as a competitive advantage and strength. And the one point, you know, that, that I can share with that is quite unique, especially having migrated back to a somewhat of a smaller city center, that being Sudbury, is that if you're looking to, you know, enhance, empower, create, you know, a more vibrant, you know, entrepreneurial startup tech community, and it doesn't have to be necessarily tech, but just entrepreneurial community, you know, there is a critical role for those entrepreneurs that you could deem to be business champions that have done well in the community. And, and I think it might have been Mike or someone who made reference to the tech savvy individual and, and, and that company and Scribindi. You know, I treat it as a call to action that those individuals play a critical role as business leaders to tell the story. Don't do it because government asks. Do it because it's a call to action for you to really demonstrate that, hey, we did it. Here's how you can do it. And that civic engagement of local champions in rural communities, you don't need to do it in large urban centers, but you need to do it in rural communities. So I think the it's really incumbent upon the business community leadership to get out, tell the story, you know, demonstrate that there are opportunities and do so you know, on, on their own volition, not necessarily because government is asking them to do that. And 
you need to do that and exploit those champions in rural communities because it's the only way you're going to win, and, among other variables, but it's a critical part of the equation that urban centers don't really need to do. And I think along along the lines of what you said, um, John, I think one thing that is unique about a center like Chatham is because it's fairly small, you can kind of know who the cast of characters are. And I think creating collisions within the community, but also within the alumni of the community, like um, there's a lot, there's a lot of, of wealth in kind of the, the spokes of, of experience that people have had. And I mean, I grew up in the Toronto tech ecosystem when it was really small and like series A's were teeny tiny and no one was really going public and, and there was no like hundred million dollar raises or anything like that at the time. And we were all reaching out to our friends in San Francisco trying to learn. Um, and so there is a, a real benefit, I think, in this kind of global connected ecosystem that we're in um, to play on that that heart piece that was brought up at the beginning again of people are really tied to the region and really love um, the the community and want to see wins there and I think um, I'd love to to see kind of a more active uh, alumni engagement obviously selfishly um, but I think there's also a, a just making collisions whether that's through co-working spaces where you have people that are working remote for larger organizations and just bringing people together because i think a lot of growth really does happen like through lunch meetings or over a beer or you know in those more casual settings than you know in your kind of siloed fiefdom of the business you're trying to build if that makes sense yep that's great alan did you want to go Sorry. yeah um yeah, yeah. you know i i think um kind of keeping with that theme, uh, innovation and new things, they don't happen in isolation, right? And it's that community. And, you know, I think the thing that's interesting when you think about Chatham Ken or versus some of the, you know, the more, the, the larger places, you know, while there's a bigger community, you know, theoretically say here in the San Francisco Bay area, it's not as tightly knit, right? As, as Chatham Ken. So the idea that if, if you're establishing those connections and telling those stories about the, the people that have been successful, and ensuring that there's access to to those people that's actually really an, a big advantage right um because having great access to to five success stories is really more impactful than having sort of a you know theoretically vague access to to a thousand right and so i think that's really important um i think that building that idea that confidence and the audacity that that yeah i mean of course innovation and new things and big ideas can happen in Chatham Kent. Why can't they? And and really understanding that because I think um, it sort of used to be the default that 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 would be wouldn't be present. But then you know showing these stories as Don was saying and, and just think, like uh, the being able to counterpoint. No, look at these successful organizations that they've grown. They've had a really great um, uh, trajectory here in Chatham Kent. They've had you know uh, great innovative products that 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 do different things um, and you can build on that in, in this really welcoming environment. I think, I think putting all that together would really, would really accelerate. I mean, I think I, I think about the community of, of colleagues and, and folks within this industry that Alan and I work in, it's not, it's not the Bay area specific, uh, just like, I don't think it needs to be Chatham Kent specific too. I mean, the tapping into the alumni is, is a great, great concept. I don't think people that have left the area know how to do that and what opportunities do exist and what are the questions and the areas that people want to collaborate with people that are elsewhere in the world on. Um, it's, it's not, uh, you know, you're not limited in that collaboration by how far away you need to drive here in the Bay Area. It's where is that person I worked with at Google years ago somewhere in the world and you connect with them like this. And I think back to some of the silver linings, the, the comfort that we've all developed with this sort of thing hopefully can 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 help with those sorts of things that there's a need let's connect you with somebody meet talk it doesn't matter where they are in the world either uh it, it, they don't need to just be in the in that immediate community so yeah that's that's incredible uh and it, it sounds like um what you're saying is these big bigger companies in rural areas need to start sharing their story and collaborating and uh kind of <clears throat> creating the that that wave of inspiration uh so in my mind, though, the question is like, who who starts that? Um, when you think of like a big company like Tech Savvy, they do care about the community. They're worried about the infrastructure, but uh, you know, who's going to tell their story and start that right that momentum? 
I think, I mean, I think there's some really like small tactical things that can get you started, even if it was like a, like an investor letter type, like quarterly update on like, here's what's going on in Chatham. Um, even if they're anonymous asks or through ActDev, if you kind of know the cast of characters, because that is one thing that Chatham can do better than, you know, any of the bigger centers, because it is fairly small, you know, who the entrepreneurs are locally. And I love like, and also there's there, Chatham's growing, right? And you have all these amazing, amazing talent coming in through people that are retired or semi-retired, maybe you have a CFO or who knows, like there's, there's lots of talent coming in. I think like really understanding the network that's there um, and creating collisions for them, whether that's like low or no cost um, co-working space would be huge because then you get, you know, someone who's remote for Shopify and someone who's remote for Ceridian and Google coming together saying like, well, we don't, this kind of sucks to work in our basement by ourselves all day, every day. But like, if we got together, we could build something and we know how, cause we've, we've seen it. Um, so I think there are some kind of like low cost ways to, to bring people together, whether that's through some of the online calls to action and, and bringing, um, individuals together just by keeping them up to date with what's going on in Chatham. Like, I don't know, get a Google list going or something. Um, and then also locally, I think there's probably a huge amount of nascent talent that just doesn't know each other. Um, yeah, that's the biggest thing is, uh, you know, there's lots of talent, but they're, they're all over here in little pockets and it's trying to kind of bring them up. Um, uh, Mike and Alan, what are some things that we can uh, learn from Silicon Valley? Some things that have uh, gone right, some things that have gone wrong that we can kind of glean from. I mean, what's interesting about the Bay Area, Silicon Valley, is that it sort of felt like it hasn't really even existed for the past year. I mean, everything like we we moved here to be at Google's headquarters. Uh, it hasn't mattered <laughs> almost for over a year, right, that we are here. Um, <clears throat> so it's been great weather, but that's about it. Uh, so I think what's interesting is that um, that that that's been removed, and I think back to you know just a lot of the ways that we've communicated over the last year plus. Um, I think is 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 something to learn from. I you know it's it's interesting because whenever I'm asked about, uh, and I don't know if Alan you feel the same way about what it's like to be in Silicon Valley, I'm I'm always a little shy with the question because we are pretty insulated within Google. It is uh, like a city within a city, if you will, and there's there's so much going on within our own day to day jobs that I personally don't have a lot of extra time to go out and network and go out. That's why I was really excited to join this and other other events that I might come in contact with. Um, I think, I, you know, if you think about the way Silicon Valley operates back to that point that it's not just operating within itself. And I think it it is connected to other other centers it's connected to waterloo it's connected to ottawa it's connected to london tokyo you know out everywhere and i think um it's successful because it is connected to those other centers where there are people uh whether it's chatham kent connecting more closely with windsor or london or toronto or detroit or other places i think that's um uh, it, it isn't just um you know ground zero and it's not connected with anything else i think that's probably what i would say uh, is, is a is a is a different way of thinking uh, for a smaller community. Yeah, I mean, I, I think I, I agree with a lot of that. I think that um, I agree with all of it, actually. Um, but I would say, um, you know, the there's nothing magical, and and you know, you think there would be, right? You go, wow, there's got to be something special or different. There's not. There's, you know, as Mike said, I mean, it's the same. It's the same thing. I think there's an inbuilt sort of confidence or idea like, okay, sure, I can do this because I'm here. But there's nothing, you know, we talk about something in the water, there's nothing in the water, the water's probably substantially worse actually um, than in Chatham Kent. So, I mean, it, uh, certainly less of it. Um, and so there's nothing, you know, it's just a, a feeling or an idea. Um, the one thing I remember thinking about this, you know, when our whole family moved here, it's like, why are we here? I mean, Mike, Mike said the weather's great. And then I traced it back and I thought, well, um, it's because, uh, you know, a couple people were at Stanford and they had an idea and then they started it where they lived. And so I think one of the things when I, when I, when I, you know, think about what, what Chatham Kent, um, and really all areas need to do is like really look at, um, education specifically post-secondary and kind of what, how are you setting up people in those uh, fields and are they understanding that they can be successful in their own community? 
right? And it does not, because a lot of these new ideas, I mean, you know, you know, when you're younger, maybe you don't know um, all the ways that, that things might not work out. And so you're so a lot more willing to try um, to try new things. And so I think really focusing on um, making sure that, you know, the innovation community that we talked about is um, effectively integrated with education. Um, and, and I think that's sort of a lot of times that's kind of the genesis of any of these, um, any of these bigger areas and any of these kind of communities that form. You mentioned, uh, you know, education and the youth, because that segues into the next question about uh, um, giving advice to young entrepreneurs. What would you tell them getting into the tech world? Uh, monstrosity. Um, like, what would you tell them? I mean, start with you, Mike. Yeah, I mean, what's interesting about the uh, world that we're living in now with, with just skilling, right? Learning new things. Um, I don't think people realize how easy it is to have the same knowledge as someone that is highly skilled. If you think about developing for uh, for the web or for Android, for the Android ecosystem or the iOS ecosystem, that is in everybody's hands. You can literally go right now to Udacity and you can learn Java, you can learn Kotlin, you can start building an Android app in a couple months or Swift for iOS or learn new modern technologies for web. And I think um, not just learning those things initially, but keeping uh, keeping modern and keeping current is easier now than it has ever been. You don't need to pay an institution any longer to learn these things. They're all they're all available to you. And I think to back to the, the networking comment, um, plugging in with people that will tell you, this is what you need to go and learn. These are the three things that you should go and spend a little bit of time in a self-serve learning platform to go and learn so that you yourself can now go and on your own build something and then shop that to to companies that need that skill. And and I think the turnaround for that is not two, three year programs. It's it's literally in your own time. And in, in a few weeks you can you can learn these things and and how just how quickly that's possible. Um, I, on, as we're trying to identify too who these skilled business people are that can connect, I think knowing what kids are interested in too and who are the luminary sort of Android developers in, in Chatham County right now? Who are the kids that are creating crazy, you know, apps that are going out on the iOS platform? Figuring out who they are, because they will also be the ones that that are business leaders that help incubate new companies and startups. So, let, let me um, let, let me kind of be kind of the not not contrarian, but take it in a slightly different area, being more specific to the likes of Chatham Kent those would be tech entrepreneurs and you know things that they should think about you know you know chatham and, and i'll be specific to chatham kent right you know so chatham kent is rooted in kind of tangible ip it's very well known in agriculture and manufacturing and it's good at it it's very good at it and those are legacy industries in canada and most legacy industries in canada as you know in aggregate contribute the majority of, uh, of our gdp but they're also the ones that seemingly are a little bit slow to maybe adopt and deploy emerging tech to you know, maintain their competitiveness on the global stage for the competitiveness of the region or the country more broadly. So, you know, thing I would things I would encourage, you know, would be entrepreneurs aspiring to get into tech in the you know Chatham Kent area. You know, we have an amazing foundation and credibility and talent in some very important industries to our country's GDP. What ideas are 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 the entrepreneurial communities thinking about and individuals thinking on starting companies? What opportunities are to enhance advanced manufacturing, to enhance agricultural output? You know, like it's still astounding to me at a national level that you know the Netherlands and a third of their of their of their of their country is dedicated to agriculture, uh, and they blow Canada Canada away in terms of you know uh, you know output from an agricultural perspective. You know, we tout ourselves as leaders in agriculture, but. My goodness, if you know an area the size of a, a third of Nova Scotia is generating more agricultural output than we as a country, I think it's ripe for innovation. So this notion of you know uh, you know immediately when people think of tech, they think of you know the likes of Google. Like who wouldn't? Of course, it's a tech icon. But I just think there's a moment to really look at the nuances of what Chatham Kent is good at. What is the entrepreneurial opportunities to build and invest in? potentially sell tech products be they tangible or intangible ip to industries that contribute meaningfully to our community's economy and 
I often work with entrepreneurs, especially in Sudbury, where there's a lot of similarities between the city of Sudbury and, and Chatham Kent, whereby you know, we're rooted in a, a skilled labor economy. We're very good at tangible IP development. The amount of tech entrepreneurs in this community is growing by leaps and bounds. And you know what? They're building stuff. They're, they're, they're actually tangibly you know, building things that have a ton of interactions with you know, the software and the intangible side, the big data and, the, and machine learning and all those elements. Uh, but I think I, I would just give a moment to pause to say we're really good at that in Chatham Kent, but there's a lot more that needs to be done. And it's a different lens on tech. Yeah, that's some uh, some great advice and uh, looking forward to that. Um, Justine, I got a question for you from our, our uh, audience. Um, do you have any words of advice, warning or encouragement for women in small communities who want to be entrepreneurs? Sure. Yeah, um, I mean, and I think it's actually uh, in line with what I was going to say for the kind of young entrepreneurs as well, which is, I think one of the most important things you can do is seek out champions. Like one of the things I think that's different from Chatham versus Toronto versus Silicon Valley is just that that swagger, or that confidence of people that are like, just believe that really big things are possible and that they can be successful doing them. Um, and I, I guess at least in my experience, um, I think my whole career has been built primarily, frankly, by men, just because there weren't a lot of women uh, in tech or in leadership roles who really believed that I could do things I didn't think I could do. And I think it's important to um, have those people in your kind of in your tight network who look at what you're doing and say like, yeah, OK, well, like, and how do we make it more? How do we make it bigger? I mean, obviously, in line with what you're trying to do. Um, but I think that's I think that's really important. And I think in a community like Chatham, because um, you've got that tight knit network, you can find those people in a couple of uh, in a couple bounces if if you uh, if you want to. The other thing I'd point out is um, when it comes to like capital and raising and things like there's never been a better time to raise. And there's a lot of really cool products um, that are trying to democratize and get away from needing to know everybody in order to raise money, if that's something you need to do to scale. Um, I look at um, the, the clear codes and the pipes and all the different companies that are coming out who are taking a percent of sales or different things that um, make it easier to get inventory or whatever you need to do. Um, and uh, you can learn those obviously through through networking and through meeting people that are in the space. But I think there's never been a better time uh, to, to start a business. And I think um, if you can surround some people that can help build your confidence, that's I think often the biggest barrier for women in getting started is you don't see people like themselves. Um, so that, that would be my primary advice. The mentorship, uh, aspect of that, I think is important, uh, helping to guide these new entrepreneurs, uh, you know, uh, up and, and growing. Um, so that's, that's important. Um, we're going to move on to infrastructure and technology. Uh, and, and as we know, inf investing in infrastructure and technology as our population grows, uh, it's critical. And this includes working on downtown districts, innovation parks, and this assets, Improving mobility, uh, housing supply, telecommunications. Uh, I'm going to pick on Don for this this question. Uh, there's actually a few of them, so I'll break it up not to overload you. Um, can you talk more about how the technology transformation in mining is helping Sudbury win the battle for talent and how NORCAT is building a tech ecosystem in their own backyard? Yeah, okay. Um, well, let, let me start by saying that you know, just to remind the viewers that I, I believe there's a lot of similarities culturally uh, between Sudbury and Chatham Kent. You know, we have a population of about 165,000 and again, rooted in a history of, you know, skilled labor industries. Uh, that said, also similarly, but also a bit of a challenge is we have a talent attraction retention issue like many small communities around Canada. And what's, what's you know, a bit unique about that is that we're rooted in an industry, uh, that being mining, that is looking to hire nationally, but also locally proportional, you know, over 100,000 new workers over the next 10 years. You know, so there are meaningful employment opportunities in an industry that's critically important to our nation's economy and, and competitiveness on the global stage. Um, so when, when you look at, you know, what does that mean in terms of spurring economic development opportunities for entrepreneurship and, you know, would be startup tech companies? You know, one of the, and, and you know, I'll build on one of Justine's comments, one of the really interesting experiments that we tried here uh, was trying to figure out on the talent side, if we are looking for more startups, 
And we care about that because it's the core driver of job and wealth creation to support an industry that's continuing to grow. What do we do to inspire talent to either come or to stay? And we, we tried a, an experiment and it was rooted in, you know, I, I was astounded at the number of people that I met that have opted to stay in the city of Sudbury their whole lives, or they go away to school around the world and they come back. And I'm thinking, why on earth are you coming back? You know, the world is your oyster or why are you staying? What is it? Um, and, you know, not to, you know, make it kind of a anticlimactic story. I still don't fully understand it. I, I can't get my head around this, this attraction to come back, but I've given up. I've given up trying to understand it and try assign some sort of method to the madness. But what I've discovered is that there's, there's this je ne sais quoi rationale as to why people want to come or stay. And what we did is we tried to figure out a creative way, again, to use that as a competitive advantage and exploit it, unabashedly exploit this, this care and concern over people who are here. And we ended up trying two things within one of our divisions at Norcat. Norcat is a, is a global kind of group of companies, and one of our divisions serves as an as a innovation center, a structure as a nonprofit, in fact. And we embarked on this initiative to say, well, let's try to figure out how to do more to encourage more companies to come and do startups and, and get talent to come. And the first thing we did was we got a bunch of credible business champions from our community to come together to provide mentorship to provide the capacity to support these would-be entrepreneurs. And why that's important, if you look at any developed economy and ask what is the number one thing that startups need, it's access to mentorship multiple research reports, multiple primary research endeavors. If you do not have a tried and true business community to support and provide capacity to these would-be entrepreneurs to either get them to stay and start or come and start a tech company, you will fail. So the, the, the civic leadership of business leaders to provide volunteer support to support would-be entrepreneurs to start a business is critical. You know, the other thing, and I think, I think it would be applicable to Chatham, which is our, our most exciting experiment that we tried here, is, you know, and, and Justine said it, after mentorship, the number one challenge to get talent to come here, to start a company or, you know, do something meaningful in terms of employment, is you need access to capital. And there's a variety of ways to do that. But what we realized, and it, this applies to many rural communities across Canada, there's a disproportionate amount of wealthy people same to say in Chatham, that are getting old, they're bored, they're done with philanthropy and charity, they got a lot of money, and they're looking for a sense of purpose. So you know what, just pause there, recognize that, but now how do you exploit that and take advantage of that as a competitive advantage? So we had no historical angel investment community. We went out and actually educated these individuals and created a call to action to say, if you want your children and your grandchildren to stay here, you got to open your check the role. So we, we went on this massive campaign to educate people about angel investment, having a role, and then so much so we actually created a local venture capital fund that our municipality contributed dollars to, to use this as a leverage to unlock even more angel capital, so co-investment fund. So I don't know why it's happened, but a lot of the they don't even really do extensive due diligence on the company. You know what their first question is? Will this create opportunities for my children and grandchildren to stay? And I have access to them in our proximal region. And, it's, and, and you might think it's a bit wacky, but it's a competitive advantage to play on the emotional connectedness of these wealthy, somewhat bored, done with philanthropy, looking for purpose. You exploit that. And I know Chatham has a huge pocket of wealthy people. Get them to, to, to care and invest, and you'll start to see the talent come. We're, we're seeing talent from other regions going, access to angel capital, access to this fund, quality of life, and all the variables that would be similar to Chatham, and, and, we're, and we're exploiting it and competing with some of the bigger jurisdictions. And it's just a unique method that I think, I think Chatham Kent would thrive in doing. And there's no cost of entry. You know, if it doesn't work, hey, it doesn't work. You know, it's, uh, but, but try it. You know, it could be an interesting strategy. Do you have a, a list of those wealthy people in Chatham Kent that you could send our way? <laughs> well, so so here's a great. Here, all kidding aside, so Matt, you say how would you even think about finding these people? The city can't lead this. You can provide a platform from an economic development. Say here's a physical space. Find one or two champions that you know, uh, you trust, and ask those people to become volunteer champions to say, 
okay, let's see if we can get a bunch of wealthy people together and then start introducing them to clients and then maybe asking them to mentor. If the, if, if, if the business community doesn't play a critical role, uh, it's, it's a struggle. And it's a struggle in rural, small city centers, less than a quarter million people. Big urban centers, everything I described, you don't need it. Trust me. You don't need to think about it as a defining strategy. It just kind of happens. But smaller communities have to figure out what they have that's unique, that you can exploit unapologetically to win. And it's, it's working here. It hasn't been easy, but it's fun. And now it's kind of eager to watch these people. And again, I don't understand it, but I don't care. I don't need to. All I need to know is that these people love and are so passionate about their community that they'll write checks if it'll create jobs and keep their grandchildren nearby. Go for it. You know, why not? That's amazing. And it does go back to these businesses sharing their story and leading the way, uh, you know, um, we've been talking a lot about talent. So I want to switch to the, the talent portion of this uh, conversation um, because I, I love that conversation uh, about, um, you know, grandparents investing in their community so their grandkids could stay there. Uh, we hear that, hear that uh, quite a bit. Um, there, there's a war on talent right now. How can Chatham Kent compete? How can they get talent and keep it in Chatham Kent? Mm -hmm. Alan? Oh, Justine, sorry. Uh, either one of you. I, don't, I, I think, I mean, Alan, I think you touched on it a little bit earlier too. Like, I think um, if you look at how skills development is changing, like, there's a real um, evolution happening. My husband teaches at a university. So, I mean, Maybe like we we talk about it all the time, but like the 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 Google skills certifications, the micro skilling, a lot of this available online, um, I think is a really big deal and is going to be important for a community like um, like Chatham. But I also think the nimbleness that a, a smaller center um, can offer in partnership with St. Clair um, or with even spaces like SOAR, where you can bring in you know a palette skills for a four to six week sales boot camp or whatever it might be that the community needs. Kind of playing on what you were talking about, Don, where you got to really understand you know supply and demand in the community so that you're you're building a pipeline that that the community can actually con consume. Um, uh, I, I think is really critical. But there's a lot of like more kind of micro skilling and and work as your resume. Um, th that's happening certainly in the HR tech space. We're looking at you know employee centric work too, where you work across multiple employers. Um, whether you know you're a W two or T four employee for one and contractor for another, um, that that work flexibility I think will continue to benefit Chatham in two ways. One, you're way more likely to be able to attract someone from you know Japan or Toronto or wherever because of the more remote enabled work. So you have less of a, a challenge, I think, in getting some of the, the core skills you need, but in, in, in allowing people to stay and being able to be educated locally, I think is a, is really important as well. Yeah, no, that, that's, that's incredible. Alan, did you have a comment as well? Yeah, About sure. That? I think, yeah, I mean, there are two pieces to it, right? There's uh, retention and attraction. And I think that, um, the retention piece is is really key, right? And that, it, as Justine was saying, that comes down to um, comes down to partnering with educational institutions, ensuring that 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 kind of mindset's there. Um, and then and then also as the local ecosystem is growing, that reinforces it, right? And so you know we talked about things. I mean, hey, you know, you could be an AI engineer based in Chatham. Right. Like that's not something that you could have said 10 years ago. Right. And that's something that that, that is there. So I think it, I think that's a, a really exciting opportunity, really focusing a lot on retention and understanding that you don't have to move away. And, and you know, I, I'm kind of thinking of my personal journey. Right. Like I didn't want to leave Chatham Kent um, when I was uh, 18 and you know, going away to university and then and then and then not not to come back and your family's there. Like I didn't want to do that, um, but I felt like I had to. And I think really ensuring that people when they're getting to that life phase where it's like okay am i going to leave or am i am i going to stay helping them understand that no and you've got the opportunities to stay here um because there are a lot of positives to chatham kent the lifestyle um the community the ability to do corn tasseling in the summer um all those things are uh, are key so so i think i think that's really important and then not to monologue but i want to go one thing i think don made an excellent point on focusing on the strengths of the community and the the knowledge, and when you think about agriculture and industry, specifically auto industry, 
Um, those are areas where there's a real credibility and you know, knowing your customers is so important. And I, I think that there are, are great opportunities for, for, for Chatham Kent to, um, to extend and, and do a lot more in those areas. Yeah, no, I, I agree. And Justine, just to kind of uh, piggyback on your comments, um, how can uh, our region work together to grow, attract and retain business and talent? I think that's going to be key instead of, again, these cities being little silos working together as a region to to really uh, grow, attract and retain. Do you want me to comment on that or that's just the No, that was a question. Yeah. How can we work together? Like what are some uh, tactics and strategies? Yeah, I mean, I go kind of with with Alan on the know your customer a little bit and like that stakeholder group like to and and all the things Don's been saying about like the more we know who we've got in the community, who the the talent pool that's ex, that's from the extended community, meaning the alumni and then the needs of of what we're trying to to grow, I think the better we can we can make matches. And like there's lots of programs we've participated in where as long as you can have as long as you have supply and demand, the middle is, is easy, right? Like so if we know that there's a pool of people in Chatham that need like uh, sales talent or, or tech sales talent or um, I don't know, project management talent, whatever it might be. I, I think that the programming, um, particularly with a lot of the government programs and grants that are out there, like that part's easy. It's more about the identifying of, of what the needs are and then making sure that we can get that in front of the, the pipeline coming. Um, and I thought it was interesting, Alan, you saying that you wanted to stay, because I actually didn't. I was like, I got to go. Like, I got to get out of here. I need to go somewhere bigger. But I wanted, but I did want to come back. And I think part of the back was kind of like, well, where, to what, like what type of, like what, what's available for me there. And um, I think that I talked to a lot of people, especially kind of as you start a family and you're trying to decide like, where do we want to be like kind of longer term as our kids go to school and stuff. There's a big opportunity there where I think a lot of people are like, yeah, but maybe my, like the, the, the track I took in tech, I don't see that in, in Chatham as much. So I think the more connections we can make, uh, the, the better off will be. Um, and I don't think we should discourage people from, from leaving if they need to, for whether that's for school or just to see what else is out there. Because I definitely feel like I'm a better ambassador of the region now, having lived in lots of different big cities than I ever was when I was, you know, 18, 19, trying to decide what I was going to do. And that's a great uh, segue into uh, the next topic about uh, kids really being the future and investing in them. And uh, I did a class presentation to grade seven and eights, and uh, I was very blown away by how just switched on they were about wanting to know what they want to do, business, starting a business, getting into tech. Um, what advice would you give to those students uh, wanting to get into the tech industry? Maybe some warnings, maybe some, you know, encouragement, some advice. Uh, what would you say to someone in grade seven, eight, nine, 10, 11, 12? Mike, I, I can, yeah, I can take that. Um, yeah, you, you mentioned switched on. It's also just surprising how how much they know and how much. Um, I mean, it's a, it's a bit of a cliche statement that the kids always know more than us, but it's um, it is it's true. I mean, and and they're using the the resourcefulness that they have, the networks that they have, um, communication that they have with everybody else that is more organic than uh, than is more sort of produced and formal, I think, in, um, in, in people who are not going to define age groups here, but it's, it's always surprising to me just how much knowledge my kids are soaking up from uh, the channels that they're tuned into. Discord's a huge thing with, uh, with, with kids these days. And it's, all, it's always interesting to hear just what information my kids are talking about, where they've discovered it, uh, what they're now interested in going in and learning more about. So, I, I mean, I think um, look, my, my mom was like this too. I think just being very tuned into what interests kids uh, the kids have and making sure to continue to try to open up as many doors to them as possible. And uh, and how easy, like I said before, I think I, I can't say it enough that the, the, the skilling portion of this, um, I think it was interesting, Justine, you mentioned how uh, some of the core, uh, core skills might need to be local, but you can source a lot of this remotely and, uh, you know, uh, Look at some even some of the people who are leaving this area right now to go and work for Shopify. Like pe people leaving, friends of mine leaving Facebook to go back to Ontario to work for, for Shopify. I think it's fascinating. Um, uh, just 
you know, in some cases, not even going back, but staying here also. That's it, a little bit of an answer to the previous question, but they're they're actually not returning to Ontario. They're working for an Ontario company here in the Bay Area while their their wife or partner uh, continues working in tech here. So um, that's interesting. But I think yeah, just the the ability for for kids to be able to uh, be interested in something, figure out what what skills they need to learn quickly to to jump on that interest, and then just you know kind of pursue it and. Maybe they maybe they start great companies in Chatham Kent as a result. That's incredible, uh, and we do need to invest in the kids and, and make sure they've got the supports and and systems in place to uh, to encourage them to move down that path. I think one just in terms of education, one thing I just wanted to add in this in this vein is it you don't have to get a CS or an engineering degree to be in tech. Right. Like when I think about tech, there's building and selling kind of the two major buckets and you there's lots of ways to participate in either one of those. So I think um, it's also useful to expose our our kids to the fact that like you can you can have an amazing career in tech without actually coding. Um, there's there's sales, there's marketing, there's implementation, professional services. There's, you know, a whole plethora of um, of skills that are needed. Um, so that's one. And on the other side, you don't have to work in pure tech to be in tech, right? Like every company is tech enabled these days. Many companies in Chatham that are considered kind of like uh, older, more traditional businesses, all of their growth is based on what they're doing with SEO and their online ad strategy and, you know, being on the Google Maps, uh, as was mentioned at the beginning, when you're when you're searching for their business, like so much of our businesses have to be tech, but doesn't mean you're joining a tech company to be in the space. So th those are kind of the two points around Ed that I want to make. Point, and as we learned in 2020, uh, a lot of businesses had to learn to be in tech. Uh, they were forced to. A lot of mom and pop shops that uh, you know dealt just in person, cash only. All of a sudden, they were forced to go online and uh, become tech. And for some, it was it was hard, and uh, I'm glad we had digital Main Street supports in there to help them, uh, for sure. Um, let's roll back the clock a little bit, and let's uh, think about when you were in school. Uh, what supports did you have, and maybe what supports, looking back, did you wish you had that kind of shaped your your career path? Would it have changed anything? Okay, I'll I'll, uh, I'll go first. I um. You know, I, I saw the, the story on the robotics team. Again, I wish that we would have had that. I wish that we would have had um, technical um, mentors in uh, in school, um, people that that um, you know could have connected with and learned more from. I think that would have been um, an amazing opportunity. And uh, you know, I, I look at I look at, at uh, what the um, uh, the students have now, and, and I think that's that's wonderful. So I think that idea. Technical um, technical mentorship um, is important, and then just telling the stories about how um, I mean, technology is central to our lives now, and children understand this. And making sure that when we're talking about you know we're celebrating local success stories and things like that, we're talking about um, um, about technology enough, um, and and not sort of talking about the past, and 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 really open my eyes to their perspectives. Uh, I've got a, an an eighth grader. And, um, you know, he was discussing things, sort of clubs that he could be in or sports. And uh, there was the math club and then there's the football team. And um, he said, well, it's really hard to get on the math club. They have tryouts and uh, the football team, they'll just let anybody join. It doesn't matter. They're always looking for people. And it was such a weird inversion of sort of cultural perspective, right? Like I thought, well, that's ridiculous, right? There'd be two kids in the math club and everybody wants to be on the football team. And that's not kind of how children are thinking today. And, and I think it's really important that that we, um, you know, reflect that, that really big cultural change and are helping to reinforce the importance of that. Um, also, when you think about like, well, what, are, what uh, uh, careers do children aspire to? And I think I saw a recent survey and it was social media influencer was the top choice and then followed by professional athlete. And, and, you know, like that's a really interesting perspective. And so I think helping to reinforce that and then helping to grow that passion that is already there in children would be something that I wish we would have had more back back in my day, I guess. Um, and it's something that I think is, is really important in, uh, in, in education. Yeah, I, uh, I, I can build on that. And Alan, you, 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 you phrased the narrative perfectly. Um, 
you know, at a personal note, you know, I, I think I was fortunate and, you know, to the credit of my parents, I had a really unique opportunity. I think it was called this, but if you remember something called junior achievement, um, whereby, you know, after school you would, I forget where the building was, but it was somewhere in the downtown core, but you learn both the technical and the business side of starting an endeavor. It's obviously not intended to become a company, but, you know, there's access to mentors and you run through the experience of validating a market opportunity, learning how to physically build something back then. It wasn't much in the way of software. Uh, although uh, I do uh, share Mike's sentiment that we actually used to host a bulletin board system at our house with the modem and people would dial in and parents would get all upset. I remember that. I'm more to the... I, I probably was the one dialing in and, and making your mother angry when I called. So. Yeah, yeah. But that's more to the credit of my brother. He's uh, he's a few years older. So he yeah, I, I used to think that was the most wild thing. But... But the reason for sharing that, obviously, it was a unique experience. But I really like how Alan kind of, kind of framed it. You know, I, I look at you know, and you see a lot of this in bigger companies. But I think you can also liken it to the experience of a of, of a youngster going through the school process. That, you know, at a young age, you know, school is intended to kind of build you know the foundational elements, right? Reading, writing, math, you know, kind of the core elements. And the one thing I think there's huge opportunities, and and I would even say within Chatham Kent, is you know, as you get older, perhaps in high school, the recognition that a lot of learning happens outside the traditional classroom and it happens through experiential, you know, opportunities, mentorship, you know, what are the opportunities for, for kids to do that in high school, even if it's awareness building, but there could be opportunities, right? So are the major, you know, manufacturing companies playing a role to educate and build competence, but also meaningful opportunities? to a grade 10, 11, 12 student. Uh, what, what about agriculture? Um, and, you know, if, if you look at, you know, the, the, the value of kind of non-traditional education and rooted in experiential and mentorship, I think you have a huge opportunity. Like how interesting would it be to have Mike and Alan come and engage these high school students as to this is what a career, a multifaceted career could look like in, 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 in Google. And, you know, Justine, same with HR, like, the amount of opportunities that Ceridian might have that these kids would never be aware of, you know, interesting. But what about if there's opportunities, like, I don't know, co-op or something like that? I think that type of learning, especially as you go through high school, is so important. And there's still massive opportunities, uh, not only in, in Chatham Kent, but, you know, across Ontario, across Canada. And I just think it's an amazing option. I think the really quickly, um, I know we're, we're running short on time here, but Justine, you mentioned the co-working space concept too. You think about being able to bring kids together. Um, some of the most interesting problems that I've seen solved within the walls of Google have been people that aren't part of that space, you know, that, that are that are parachuting in, thinking about a problem that's been that's existed for you know 20, 30 years and just thinking fresh about it. Imagine having a group of high school students thinking about a problem that local industry might post, right? And have them think through that problem whether it's a weekend hack event or, or something where there's a, a very sort of intense time period that they're they're working to think about those things. They figure out who the, the people in their community are that are actually, uh, wh whether it's design, UX, they're hardware developers or software developers, like who are these people? Those events kind of give people a chance to see who's there. Um, I think when I was growing up, it was really tough to find the people who were interested in uh, in in computers generally, right? Forget what was going on on the computer. Just people that had one. Um, I didn't know, and I probably missed two or three of them in my high school that also had one that were too quiet and just didn't mention it. So I think figuring out ways that you can kind of bring these kids' kind of interests to life, and and apply it to established business too. I think your comment earlier, Don, of not um, thinking just about a tech company, but applying tech to things that exist. You know, think about bringing high school students to some of the problems that existing industry has so yeah it sounds like uh, we need to have local businesses create like a tech day and invite uh, students in and uh, i think it's an incredible idea yeah um given the time we're going to move on to the, the the last topic the future of economy uh, i'm going to ask you to pull out your crystal ball and uh, your projections um what is one trend that local companies uh, should pay attention to in order to future-proof themselves uh, for Chatham Kent. I, I can go 
to start, I guess. Um, one I think is just future of work and how people are going to work. Like it's a going to be a huge advantage for Chatham in some ways and a huge disadvantage in others, right? So as you think about um, the ability to not just work remotely, but work across employers and things like that, I think on one hand, huge advantage to Chatham in that you're going to be able to access a pool of talent that you haven't before. I think on the other hand, you're going to be competing with um, like U.S. Toronto tech wages potentially or, or others where, um, you know, you may not have seen that before for your current employees and for future prospects. So I think, I don't know, I'm curious and maybe, maybe some of you on the, on the panel have different views, but I'm curious to see how, like how comp creates problems um, as people can take jobs in, in bigger centers, but stay remote. Um, but also, you know, uh, the, the remoteness being a, a big advantage um, in Chatham. I think people that understand um, kind of the evolution of freelance and gig um, and being able to really chunk work in measurable fashions will be a huge uh, benefit to local organizations where you can like be very specific about your ask and find someone who's highly skilled to, to accomplish that ask instead of having someone kind of drag a project on for a year that's not very skilled in that space. Like there's going to be lots of, of uh, opportunity there, but just general future of work. Um, I talked on the employer side, but also the community that the idea of the 15 minute community and um, people wanting to live and be able to work and get their groceries and, and all these things in these kind of like micro areas as Richard Florida and lots of kind of city thinkers are talking about huge advantage for Chatham because uh, you guys already have a, a tight knit community. And I think, um, you know, making that attractive to people as they can choose where they want to live is a big deal. Yep. No, uh, that's an uh, incredible points. Um, yeah. The, the only other, you know, I, I think those are great points indeed. You know, the other trend that I think business has to be very wary of, and again, I'll, I'll migrate to the legacy industry and the importance of manufacturing and agriculture to, to the Chatham Kent region. You know, a lot of these legacy industries in Canada are migrating to what I would call as an outsourced innovation model, meaning there's recognition for them to innovate and stay nimble that no longer can they just have a, a team of pointy head scientists that work for their company locked away in a dungeon saying thou shalt innovate and make us more competitive. There's a lot of emerging recognition. Well, there always has been, but it's increasingly becoming important that those industries such as in this case, manufacturing and agriculture for the incumbents to stay ahead of the curve, a lot of their new innovations and ideas are gonna come from external sources. And, and, and Mike and Justine, the concept around these tech spaces and hackathons and challenges are critically important. But from an emerging trend, you're seeing other jurisdictions now and I'm the companies operating in those jurisdictions recognizing that they might have to buy and, and invest in and or you know create these venture studios to enable the creativity of a outsourced model to help them maintain their competitiveness and it can look a variety of different ways so i think the the the, the incumbent industries in the community uh, i i hope they're trying to maintain their competitiveness around giving opportunities and in, in engaging with a, an external community, providing the right supports, be that investment, whatever it looks like, acquisitions, um, because other jurisdictions are doing it and the legacy industries are, are, are transforming following that trend. So if they think historically they can just do it internally, not talk to anyone, uh, it's going to be problematic. So it's a, it's a really important interesting trend that we've uh, that we're seeing in mining you know a lot of the innovations in mining historically were were founded within the confines of the four walls of that mining company now it's probably less than 15 percent it's all an external outsourced innovation model so think of all the cool tech jobs that are coming out as a, as a result of that and the mining companies love it because it's like outsourced research and development and tech innovation and there's a whole transition in can industries thinking that way so uh, I would encourage those in those industries in Chatham Kent to think that way. Pressure off of these companies to collaborate and and outsource uh, that type of work. Um, Alan, I'm going to pick on you for this next question. Um, what do you think the future of tech is in smaller rural communities? And you can be as wild as you want. Just okay. we're thinking five, ten, fifteen years down the road. Just yeah. I, you know, eventually, obviously, robots taking over and, and controlling us. But before that, because um, I assume that'll be global. Um, before that, um, I think that, you know, 
the, one of the bigger, you know, this continuing trend, right? It's been happening for a long time, you know, 30 years at least, you know, where this idea of lowered barriers to entry in general, right? You know, happened originally, you know, we saw it in manufacturing, you know, happening an awful lot um, through the past few de decades where manufacturing doesn't have to be necessarily located in one spot and doesn't have to stay there. Um, and that's because of lower barriers to entry. You know, we've, so that's an, that's a threat. And, you know, it's kind of as Don talked about or a challenge that talked about you can't just rely on some incumbency or some barrier to entry that, that you're going to be set. But it's also an opportunity um, because if your barriers to your traditional industry are um, lowering, then, then you've got the opportunity to enter new places and, and new opportunities. We've also seen that with um, location where people work, um, but that can, that's becoming increasingly uh, detached from where the company is technically headquartered. Or where the work is technically done, or 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 that that idea of, of place. So I think that um, the idea, you know, our economy is increasingly becoming about technology, right? I, I think that that this idea that you could be a technology company and a regular company, I think, is breaking down. That 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 distinction doesn't kind of continue to make a lot of sense. And I think in the future, like technology is just a thing that you would have to do as a company. And so I I would think that. Um, the future for uh, technology in, in, in small communities is just continuing to embed technology and growth in technology and a focus on technology as a core part of their business, whatever their, you know, their, whatever they think their core line is now, um, innovation and technology, you know, whether that be outsourced innovation, be partnering or, or home built or however that work, that's really the core piece, right? That, that, and then almost that label of being a technology company that doesn't make sense. You're like a company that uses electricity, right? You know, that's not a, a, a thing that, that we would, we would we'd call a company. And I think that's kind of the overall trend, that idea of mainstreaming of technology. It's, it's not a niche thing or just a department. It's what you do. Um, and, and it would seem to me that that's a great opportunity for um, for small communities um, if they really fully embrace it. Do you have any uh, predictions uh, aside from robots? <laughs> yeah, also something I predict. Uh, um, no, I, I think it, it's a really good point. I think there's kind of two streams here. There's the tech company, which Adam's sort of dismantling and dispelling a little bit. And, and and also just the way that you're you're making use of it, just like you'd have machines in a factory, you have technology all around you. Um, I, I think just the way uh, the way that you're adopting the same things that people outside of a small community are adopting, not to wade into really big, hairy topics like AI and machine learning, but if you if you just look at the concept of machine learning as, as something that's future looking, of taking, you know, things that or even computers and non-automated ways are doing and, and looking at, at what sort of quantum leaps you can take in anything that you're doing um, by having it, it like training a computer to do something for you and humans doing that, not computers doing that. Um, I think it to me is, is fascinating, especially in the, in the areas of things like agriculture. Um, there are a, a couple of, there's a group within our, um, uh, within greater alphabet, so outside of Google, but within the, the the larger ecosystem of companies within alphabet that are focused on this in agriculture and and the ways that uh, lo local agribusiness um, and manufacturing, but agribusiness can look at that. If you just think about the repetitiveness of, of farming and agriculture, um, I think just some some of the technologies that are literally only five years old um, can mean for some of these businesses and and. The future, I think, is looking more closely at that and and how businesses in a small community like Chatham Kent can um, can can adopt those things and see how they in in small in small pieces. I don't. It's very daunting, right? The whole concept is really daunting. It's hard to get your head around. But I think if you can look at small pieces to adopt and pilot and prototype and try, to me that that's absolutely how it how uh, what the future looks like. And yeah, when you look at the big picture and the, all the pieces, it is overwhelming. Um, so that's great advice to just kind of um, pick and choose and, and start with that. Um, so given the the time, I just I want to wrap up the questions. We've got a couple of Q and A that I'll throw at you from the from the guests, the recipients, um, and then we'll wrap this up. We want to make sure everybody's got their afternoon to to finish up there. Um, here's a question, uh, uh, maybe for uh, for Justine. Uh, with many people working from home, would you consider moving back to Chatham-Kent? Could you please provide reasons for this choice? 
Um, <laughs> I just at least at least three reasons. Like, what can you say? No, but in, in all honesty, I don't know that we won't be back. I think, um, you know, we've lived in places all over the state, spent a lot of time in Toronto. We're in London now because that's where um, my husband's teaching. And up until this year, there was a physical presence there, but that's only an hour commute from Chatham. I think um, the biggest thing for us, and I've talked about it a little bit, is uh, I think the importance of feeling like you're in an ecosystem of people that are like you, like you um, are generally kind of the average of the five people that you spend the most time with. We all hear that. And, and certainly there's some networking that you can get uh, through, you know, staying in touch with your, your colleagues online, but there's something about the energy of being with, uh, people that, you know, are, are dreaming big and think big things are possible. Um, and, uh, you know, being able to have a beer about, you know, uh, business ideas and, and knowing that, um, you're part of a, a community that, you know, works like you and, um, kind of things like you do work-wise. So I think for us, that's, that's always been a bit of the, like, just speaking totally candidly, a bit of the worry in moving back to, um, like Chatham or Windsor full-time. I mean, there's some access to Detroit and certainly we spend time in, in Toronto, but that knowing that there's a group of, of that there's a place to belong professionally, I think is, a, is something that we think about. Um, but I do think that knowing all the great things that are going on in the community and getting linked in with people is is hugely beneficial and something that you know we'd be interested in doing as we decide where we end up in the future you've got a few people in the crowd that are disappointed you're not moving back so uh, <laughs> i don't know um, <laughs> anything's possible right i mean we're talking about robots so <laughs> uh we'll do one last q a and then we'll wrap this up we'll ask yvonne to come back on the stage uh but don will ask you this question this is from the q a panel uh that has quite a few uh, upvotes there um, when trying to build networks of people is there anything that is a waste of time and should be avoided wow okay that's an that's an interesting question in terms of networks of people well so if I if I interpret that to mean you know what is the you know the, the role of the community to support innovation entrepreneurship etc. You know I can share you know experiences and things that we attempted when I was in the urban center at the Mars Discovery District and more recently with all the experiments that we try with the NORCAT Innovation which is our role as a as a regional innovation center. You know the the key learning I would have is if you are looking to establish a network and a variety of partners that work together and trust each other obviously goes without saying i'm of the opinion that if you're doing it for economic development reasons and you want that that vibrant culture it needs to be business community led it can't be led by government you know economic development uh in in the city of, of chatham play a critical role but provide a platform provide you know physical infrastructure and support services but find those champions that can spearhead, you know, the creation of mentorship networks designed functionally to work together to support would-be or existing entrepreneurs in the community and give them the supports with municipal dollars to enable them to focus on that. Um, you know, I go back to, you know, the collegialness that I discovered, you know, when you get wealthy people hanging out saying, hey, let's work together and, and invest in companies, interesting je ne sais quoi bond that don't try to understand it just let them know that they play a critical role in the future economic prosperity of our community again private sector citizen led they'll build those relationships they'll feel empowered but provide them the platform and the strategy and the raison d'etre as to why this is good for you know broader economic development and they'll run with it and they'll develop that collegial elements that they're not doing it because they they're obligated or they're they're being paid to and therefore are required to they'll do it again for this interesting cultural affinity to support their own and you know the other thing around partnerships too taking it away from the personal level you know if you look at you know the major driver of job and wealth creation is startups and small enterprises getting that right and helping those companies grow and grow fast is critical mentorship is important capital is important we've talked about talent and i think all the ideas were interesting but you know the best thing you can do for for a, a startup company absolutely the best thing you can do is give them a purchase order so is there a consortium of business companies in the community 
that could come together and say, let's provide, and Mike said it perfectly, let's give them a, a reference site to test, prototype, build a proof of concept. And maybe there's a municipal incentive where you can apportion funding to enable these existing operations to adopt and try and test, but embedded in this you know, company-led culture where, hey, who are the top 50 companies in Chatham? Let's buy into creating some of our business to give proof of concept opportunities, software, hardware, doesn't matter. And if they need a bit of incentive, that's where the city might come in and say, hey, we'll, we'll apportion you some funding with the distraction, but it's critical. It's creating opportunities. Those types of networks are all rooted in business sector led, let the municipality be the platform to provide a bit of guidance and policy and economic numbers. But that's what I've seen to be very successful in a lot of smaller city centers, not only in Canada, but in jurisdictions I've worked with around the world. Great idea, Don. Um, one last question I'm going to sneak in uh, for Mike or Alan. Uh, should we be avoiding robots or trying to befriend them before they take over? Really leaving that for Alan. <laughs> Got myself into that. Um, uh, I, they'll turn on you in the end. So, um, so I think you should enjoy the time. Um, but uh, I, I guess I'm going to come back since you since you gave me the mic. I'm going to go back. Um, you know, when I think about building on what Don was saying about the the top local companies um, and giving opportunities, give you know, give a give a startup the, their first uh, uh, first order. The other thing I think is back to internships. And really looking at you know for for secondary school for post secondary are there technology based internships like are we really making the effort to uh, to do that and um, I think I think that's a, a hugely important thing for the community. Thank you so much, and I want to thank you all uh, for your time today. Uh, this has been an amazing discussion. Uh, thank you, Alan, Don, Justine, Mike. I appreciate you uh, uh, coming back to Chatham Kent virtually from your your um, appreciate the insight and the advice you're giving to our, our audience. I'd like to ask Yvonne to come back on stage and close us out. Thank you so much. Thank you to Matt for being an amazing facilitator and also thanking our panelists for coming back to Chatham today and taking time out of their busy schedules, even though they're working from home. I know they all have very important careers and, and, and kids and family and whatever to get back to. Um, but yeah, that, that concludes it, Matt. Great job facilitating. I don't think I heard any dad jokes, though, so you might have to uh, share some in the follow-up email. Uh, but I just want to say again, thank you. Uh, I'm just looking at my Microsoft Teams with my team, and it's preach, preach, preach. I, I can't, I agree with everything. And I think in terms of, you know, in my goodbye remarks, uh, a number of uh, things. Number one, this video will be recorded, so share it. Share it with friends, families. Let everyone hear these great ideas that these panelists and, and former Chatham Kent expats and residents have to say. I think everything is just a great roadmap for how do we make Chatham Kent a hub of innovation. Um, you're also going to get that access to the uh, digital artwork created by our own John Mark Bashon. Uh, so you can download that again, print it at home. And finally, uh, just a few things again, share the video, connect with our panelists, share stories. And I think Don said it, be that first customer give those companies buy local be the first you know the purchase order share that uh, and share all the local businesses that exist uh, and again if you're an entrepreneur thinking about a tech idea uh, feel free to reach out to we tech alliance we're here to help you um, and then just finally i just want to say thank you to our economic development partners um, for those that are watching um, if you need anything want to learn more about the industries in chatham kent uh, matt jamie Andrew's on the line, feel free to reach out to them on social media or check them out. They've got an amazing newsletter full of lots of opportunities. Uh, and again, let's uh, let's keep the momentum moving. Uh, so with that, I think we've got five minutes. So we're going to close things off. We'll leave the virtual networking portion floor open uh, for maybe a few last minute conversations that you may have. But until next time, uh, we hope to bring this back uh, for year two and keep again keep this conversation going so on behalf of we tech alliance and the chatham kent economic development thank you so much to the attendees our panelists our speakers and most importantly our amazing panelists today <laughs>